Hello and welcome. We are glad that you chose to be a part of this study on today. We're continuing our series on the Holy Spirit, and we just pray that you will be blessed by uh, the series. You have been blessed by the series. If this is your first time joining us, welcome. And we encourage you to go back and check out the beginning portion of this series on the Holy Spirit. We always like to begin our time in prayer because we believe in the power of prayer. We believe that God is able to move through our prayers. And so uh, let us pray at this time. Heavenly Father, we're grateful for this day. We thank you for your love and your goodness. We thank you for your spirit who guides us and leads us. We thank you for your son, Jesus, who died and was raised for our sins and for our justification. We ask your blessings upon our world, upon this land, upon us as we seek to grow, as we seek to thrive, as we seek to develop in these conditions. Help us to always remember that you are with us. In Jesus' name, amen. So we are in our study on the Holy Spirit on today. Uh, we are looking at the Spirit and the disciples. This is part two of that lesson, the spirit and the disciples. And we're particularly going to be looking at uh, the book of Acts, but we'll start off in the book of John. Uh, now, what we see as we have looked at Jesus and him possessing the Holy Spirit, uh, we see that the spirit is a part of the life of Jesus. Jesus fully possesses the spirit, and as such, he is able as the Messiah to give the spirit. And so Jesus bestows the spirit upon the disciples. Let's take a look at John chapter 20, verse number 19 through verse number 23. John 20, 19 through 23. So when it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and when the doors were shut where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood in their midst and said to them, peace be with you. And, he, and when he had said this, he showed them both his hands and his side. And the disciples then rejoiced when they saw the Lord. So Jesus said to them again, peace be with you as the father has sent me i also send you and when he had said this he breathed on them and said to them receive my spirit receive the holy spirit rather if you forgive the sins of any their sins have been forgiven them if you retain the sins of any, they have been retained. So Jesus here breathes. Uh, and when you look at the translations in verse number 22, on them is in italics. Uh, if you're looking at, say, New King James or New American Standard, which means it is uh, supplied by the translators, but did not occur in the original text. And they supplied this in order to help bring clarity to the text. Uh, but it's important to note that the Bible simply says, Jesus breathed and said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. Now, this breathing of Jesus was not them getting the Holy Spirit, receiving the Holy Spirit, that would come at Pentecost. But what we have here is a symbol of what's to come, uh, but it's not the actual imparting of the Holy Spirit. Jesus breathing and saying, receive the Holy Spirit, reinforces the fact that the Spirit comes from Christ. And when he does this, he does it in the context of sending his uh, disciples out, he does it in the context, in context of giving them peace. And so uh, he breathes 
And it's interesting that spirit, wind, and breath, the Greek word is the same Greek word. And so Jesus exhales. He uh, he, he breathes. Uh, you, you kind of get the imagery in your mind. receive the Holy Spirit. Uh, so there is this uh, symbolic transfer of power from Jesus to his disciples. All right, so let's, let's look at uh, Acts chapter one. And now we're gonna spend the rest of our time looking at the spirit in the book of Acts. So John 20, Jesus promises, promises the spirit symbolically, sends forth the spirit, uh, lets his disciples know that uh, you will receive the spirit and it will be my spirit, it will emanate from Christ. So Acts chapter one, verses one through eight. The first account I compose, and this is Luke writing, uh, the first account I composed, Theophilus, about all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day when he was taken up to heaven after he had, by the Holy Spirit, given orders to the apostles whom he had chosen. To these, he also presented himself alive after his suffering by many convincing proofs, appearing to them over a period of 40 days and speaking of the things concerning the kingdom of God. So here we have in Acts the uh, fact that the word of God uh, written by Luke, Luke says in the first writing, I wrote to you what Jesus began to do and teach until the day he was taken up to heaven. Uh, and Luke says in verse number two, after he had by the Holy Spirit given orders to the apostles whom he had chosen. So the, there's this connection, this link between Jesus and the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit continues to be an empowering agent in the life of Jesus. Uh, verse number four. Gathering them together, he commanded them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait for what the Father had promised, which he said, you heard of from me, for John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Uh, so when they had come together, they were asking him, saying, Lord, is it at this time you are restoring the kingdom to Israel? Now, this is important because many of the disciples thought, and many of the followers of Jesus thought he was going to be a revolutionary who would uh, bring about a new kingdom. But Jesus makes the point during his ministry that his kingdom is not of this world and that he does not fight with the same weapons that those in this world fight. Uh, verse number seven, Jesus says, uh, it is not for you to know times or epics which the father has fixed by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and even to the remotest part of the earth. Uh, and so Jesus lets his disciples know that you will receive the spirit. Uh, this is not about a revolution to overthrow the Roman government, but you will have power and that power uh, will come when the Holy Spirit is upon you. I want you to notice some things uh, that since Christ gives the Spirit, the Spirit remains secondary to Christ. Uh, the Spirit remains secondary to Christ. The gift is always secondary to the giver of the gift, all right? Uh, and one of the things that we will see as we go into Acts is that there is no church without the Spirit. 
Uh, there is no church without the spirit. Uh, it is the spirit who allows the apostles to receive power and the spirit is the life of the church. Uh, and as Jesus is teaching in his ministry, the spirit was working. Now he's saying his, to his disciples, the Holy Spirit is going to be yours. So when we see Jesus in the Gospels, Jesus is the only one upon whom the Spirit rests. Uh, it's not resting on the apostles. In the Gospels, the Spirit rests on Jesus. What he does, what he speaks, is in the power of the Spirit. And we've seen that from previous studies. And so what we have here now is that the same Spirit who rested upon Jesus in his ministry would empower the apostles for their witness. Uh, he would be a source of power in the life of the apostles, in the life of the disciples. The same spirit uh, that was working in Jesus will be given and will be working in the apostles, right? Uh, and the same Jesus who taught during his earthly life would continue to instruct his apostles through the presence of the Spirit. And so the apostles, they had experienced the Spirit through the presence of Jesus. After Pentecost, however, they would experience Jesus through the presence of the Spirit. And so the Spirit would empower them, embolden them, instruct them in uh, the ways of Christ Jesus. And so their experience of Christ after Pentecost or after his ascension would be through the Spirit. Their experience with the Spirit prior to his ascension was through Christ. And that same Spirit that rested on Jesus would empower the apostles for their witness. Now in Acts chapter 4, uh, we see the role of the Holy Spirit. Uh, so Acts chapter 1, there's the promise. Acts chapter 2, the Spirit comes and the church begins. And uh, Peter tells the crowd there, repent and be baptized and you receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is to you, to your children, and to all who are far off, as many as the Lord our God shall call. So the Spirit ushered in uh, the beginning of the church. Uh, here in Acts chapter 4, the church is up and running, if you will. And we're going to look at several verses from Acts chapter 4. Acts chapter 4, and we'll be looking at verses 1 through 12. As they were speaking to the people, the priests and the captain of the temple guard and the Sadducees came up to them, being greatly disturbed because they were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection of the dead. And they laid hands on them and put them in jail until the next day, for it was already evening. But many of those who heard the message believed, and the number of men came to be about 5,000. Now, uh, just see what God does here. The church is being persecuted. The disciples are being thrown in prison or in jail, they are disturbing the peace, if you will. Uh, the religious leaders, the Sadducees, the temple guards, they, uh, the, the priests, they are unable to uh, really control the apostles to stop this movement. They are disturbed by uh, the teachings about Jesus and the resurrection of the dead. So they decide they're going to throw the apostles into prison. However, the gospel is still powerful, still effective, even when those who proclaimed it were put into prison. Many believe, and the church grew, and the Bible says that the number came to be about 5,000. Verse number five, on the next day, their rulers and elders and scribes were gathered together in Jerusalem, and Ananias, the high priest, was there, and Caiaphas, 
and John and Alexander and all who were of priestly descent. When they had placed them in the center, they began to inquire, by what power or in what name have you done this? Then Peter, watch this, filled with the Holy Spirit said to them, rulers and elders of the people, if we are on trial today for a benefit done to a sick man as to how this man has been made well, let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ, the Nazarene, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by this name, this man who stands before you, it this man stands before you in good health. He is the stone which was rejected by you, the builders, but which became the chief cornerstone. And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven that has been given among men by which we must be saved. Uh, the Bible says there in verse number eight that Peter was filled with the Holy Spirit. And this filling of the Holy Spirit emboldens Peter to speak. Uh, you may recall from our last lesson how uh, Jesus tells his disciples in Matthew chapter 10 that you're going to stand before magistrates and uh, before governors and kings and uh, the words will come to you because they will be given by the Father. And so it looks like we see evidence here. Uh, Peter filled with the Spirit, he speaks in the power of the Spirit, and in speaking in the power of the Spirit, there is a boldness that is in his speech. We see this boldness again in Acts chapter 4, verses 29 through 31. And now, uh, Lord, take note of their threats and grant that your bondservants may speak your word with all confidence while you extend your hand to heal and signs and wonders take place through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place where they were gathered was shaken, gathered together was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak the word of God with boldness. There's a connection between speaking with boldness, speaking with confidence, and being filled with the Spirit. Uh, this is confirmation that God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. And so we see this boldness that comes with the spirit to be able to say what needs to be said the way that it needs to be said, to express it, to communicate it in a way that pleases the Lord. And that is a blessing to those who need to hear the word of God. The church cannot be afraid to speak up. The spirit empowers us and emboldens us to speak in the power of God. We don't have to fear. We don't have to worry. We must speak with the same boldness because it's the same spirit who resides in us. Now in Acts chapter 7, verses 51 through 53, Acts 7, 51 through 53. The, uh, the Bible says, you men who are stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears are always resisting the Holy Spirit. You are doing just as your fathers did, which one of the prophets did your fathers not persecute. They killed those who had previously announced the coming of the righteous one, whose betrayers and murderers you have now become. You have you who received the law as ordained by angels and yet did not keep it. Uh, here, we see this idea being introduced. You resisted the Holy Spirit as the message is being shared as uh, a defense of the gospel is being made here by Stephen. Uh, Stephen uh, says that you're stiff-necked, you're uncircumcised in your heart, and your ears are always resisting 
the Holy Spirit, uh, to resist the gospel, to not heed the message, is to resist the Holy Spirit, uh, because it is the Spirit who is uh, active in the conversion process. Uh, the Spirit desires for your hearts to be soft and your ears to be open, but when we reject the message, it is synonymous with resisting the Spirit of God. Uh, and that's a message to the world today. It's also a message to Christians. When we resist what God desires to do, when we go against the Word of God, we are resisting the Spirit of God. The Spirit wants to work. The Spirit wants to move. We must allow Him to have His way in our lives. Then in Acts chapter 9, verse number 31. Acts chapter 9, verse number 31. So the church throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria enjoyed peace, being built up and going on in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit, it continued to increase. What happened? Uh, the Spirit gave the church comfort in the face of difficulty, in the face of persecution. The people enjoyed peace. Uh, but the Holy Spirit was a source of comfort in the life of the people of God. And we are grateful that the Spirit is a source of comfort in our lives on today. Uh, the Lord brings his people through a time of crisis. Through his deliverance, the church finds peace and continues to flourish and thrive. And now, finally, in Acts chapter 13, verse number one through four, Acts 13, one through four. And now there were at Antioch in the church that was there prophets and teachers, Barnabas and Simeon, who is called Niger and Lucius of Cyrene and Manian, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch and Saul, while they were ministering to the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Then when they had fasted and prayed, they laid their hands on them and sent them away. So being sent out by the Holy Spirit, they went down to Seleucia and from there, they sail to Cyprus. So here uh, we have the Spirit working, the Spirit moving. Uh, the Spirit wants to advance the mission of the gospel. And so the Spirit calls uh, and says, set apart, sanctify Barnabas and Saul for the work that I have called them. So the Spirit of the Lord is seen here calling people to do the Lord's work and sending them out to do the work. Uh, it is not the initiative of man, but it is the prompting of the Spirit uh, that sends out those who proclaim the message of God. Uh, and so the Holy Spirit desires to see the kingdom of God grow, to see the Church of Christ continue to be strengthened, and he works to this end to fortify the church, to encourage the church, to empower the church in order to be all that Christ has called her to be. And so for next time, we want you to look at Romans chapter eight, Romans chapter eight for next time and answer the question what this text reveals about uh, the Holy Spirit. Think on these passages, go back, review them, look at them, dig a little bit deeper, and it's our prayer that we will see you next time. May God bless you and keep you, uh, and we look forward to being able to see you in person real soon.